Hello, I'm Morgan Jorgensen, the Senior Manager of Donor Relations and Events for the Truman Library Institute. Welcome to Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 election and the battle for America's soul. This is the latest installment in our series of programming commemorating the 75th anniversary of Truman's presidency and his year of great decisions, 1948. Tonight, we're joined by A.J. Bame, New York Times bestselling author of The Accidental President, Harry S. Truman and the Four Months That Changed the World, White Lies, The Double Life of Walter F. White and America's Darkest Secret, and tonight's topic, Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 election and the battle for America's soul. A master storyteller, Bame is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal. His articles have also appeared in the New York Times, Popular Science, Men's Journal, and numerous other publications. He is a dear friend of the Truman Library Institute, and it is our absolute pleasure to have him back with us today. Thank you for joining us tonight, AJ. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. With you. AJ, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thank you everybody for being with us tonight and welcome to my humble little office and in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, 75th anniversary. It's hard to believe. Um, I will say that uh, we're going into a really exciting election year. I know a lot of us have already started gluing into our television and um, or televisions and people, the one question I get above all else, having written two books about the Truman administration is um, what would Harry Truman say if he was, uh, if he was here today, what would he do? And my answer is really clear. I have no idea. I have no idea what he would say, but I do know, know this. Um, it's hard to think of any other modern polit uh, politician in America who to this day seems to be really adored and embraced by both by conservatives and liberals Democrats and Republicans. Um, I can tell you, uh, I have um, signed copies of uh, Dewey Defeats Truman for almost every Republican senator in Congress right now, including Mitch McConnell, uh, former senator from Truman's home state, Roy Blunt of Missouri. Um, and yet he's a liberal. How do, what do we make of that? A liberal who gets you know touted on the campaign trail by Donald Trump even. What accounts for that? How can we explain it? And I think Given our presentation tonight, I'm hoping that we'll get into some of that, and it'll be clear by the time we get to the end. So uh, here's the cover of the book, and here we begin, all right? Um, I want to just talk about this picture a little bit, because to me, it's just, it's such a riveting picture. It's such a historic and dramatic moment um, in our history. Now, in my book, The Accidental President, Harry S. Truman in the Four Months That uh, Changed the World, I spend the first 37 pages on this one day. This is April 12th, 1945. Obviously, you see Truman uh, taking the oath. Um, directly behind his right shoulder is, the, uh, is Admiral Leahy, the chief of staff of the White House. Uh, you see Margaret, his daughter, and the first lady directly to his left. And what is happening here? We're at the climactic months of World War II, right? And Truman is this obscure senator who became the vice presidential candidate almost by mistake in 1944. Few Americans knew who he was or what he stood for. Uh, following in the footsteps of FDR, he'd never been the mayor of a city, never governor of a state. He had no college degree, and he, he had never had the money to own his own home. Um, during the first four months of his presidency, which is what the accidental pre uh, president is about, uh, he goes from this obscure senator and this obscure vice president to president of the United States, who has an 87% approval rating, and that's higher than FDRs had ever been. Think about that. It's a pretty dramatic narrative arc right there. Um, so that's where Dewey defeats Truman begins. He's sailing across the ocean, coming back from Potsdam. And I set this dramatic scene at the beginning where he's sitting with a, a guy named Judge Sam Rosenman, who had been uh, one of FDR's top speechwriters. And he says, you know, Sam, judge, judge, uh, I got to co go back to America. The war is over. Uh, we have to reconvert to peacetime economy. It's going to be really bumpy. And the American people expect me to tell them now who I am. I'm no longer a wartime president. And he tells the judge, the ju it's such a dramatic scene. The judge is uh, scribbling. He was a lawyer, uh, an attorney. So he's scribbling on a yellow legal pad. 
And Truman says, I'm going to come out for these principles. These are what my policies are. And the judge looks at him and he says this, well, I suppose I've been listening to too many rumors about what you are going to do. They are saying you are going to be quite a shock to those who followed Roosevelt, that the New Deal is as good as dead, that we are all going back to normalcy, and that a good part of the so-called Roosevelt nonsense is now over. In other words, that the conservative wing of the Democratic Party has now taken charge. And in fact, Truman is going to go in the exact opposite direction. He's an avowed liberal. And so he creates something called the spe Special Message to Congress, presenting a 21-point program for the reconversion period. And what he's talking about is laws to expand Social Security, unemployment, and veterans' benefits. He's going to ask Congress to raise the minimum wage. He wants to give more subsidies to farmers. Uh, and essentially, what he wants to do is raise spending on just about everything. And uh, the Republicans in, in, in Congress are repulsed, uh, and they're ready to fight back. One of them says, this begins the campaign of 1946, meaning the midterms. The gloves would be off from here on out. And so that's the beginning of the story of the 1948 election. Now, by the time we get to this point, which is the Democratic National Convention um, in 1948, that's obviously Truman speaking and sitting behind him is Alvin Barkley of Kentucky. The vice is vice presidential candidate. Uh, by the time we get to this, Truman has lost the House. He's lost the Senate. Uh, there's been this labor crisis that has crippled the economy. There's massive inflation. Americans fear there's going to be new world war with the Russians in this new nuclear age. Uh, there's concern that there's going to be a depression. And Truman's approval rating has gone from 87 percent to 37 percent. And he comes in and gives this speech to this flat audience. He's late. It's two in the morning. And nobody believes this guy has any shot. And he comes into the hall in Philadelphia and gives this historic speech. One person uh, described it like this. It was one of the most electric, uh, electrifying things I had ever been present at. Another said, I'd never in all my life got such a tremendous buildup in such a short time. And what Truman does is, he comes out and he says, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to fight for the presidency. We're going to go deep on civil rights, which was highly con controversial at the time. Uh, he's going to support big labor. He's going to support farmers. And then he says this. Let's see if this, if this uh, video works. Senator Barkley and I will win this election and make these Republicans like it. Don't you forget that. I love that. Senator Barkley and I will. Anyway. Uh, nobody believes it's going to happen. Nobody. Now, there are four candidates in 1948. And in Dewey Defeats Truman, I go pretty deep on each of them. I uh, I really wanted to bring out the personalities and their campaigns because each of them, they all won a lot of votes. Uh, and each of them represented a significant portion of the American electorate. And so if you put those four campaigns together, as I do in the book, you really get a good feeling of what was happening in America at that time. Um, now, this is Henry Wallace is at the bottom of right. And uh, I'll just introduce his character through a little story. Um, when the accidental president came out, uh, I was talking about Henry Wallace on live national radio for a, a program, uh, NPR called 1A. And I was talking about how Henry Wallace uh, was sort of loved and hated within the Democratic Party. And that a lot of people thought he was too far to the left and that a lot of people thought he was a crackpot. And I used the word crackpot. And I'm live on the radio. And I can see the host of the radio kind of like shifting. His eyes are going all over the place. And I only found out afterward that the moment I called him a crackpot, which wasn't really me, what I should have said was a lot of people in the Democratic Party at the time called him this word. The switchboard lit up. Uh, and it was a really amazing moment because it made me realize that even today, all of these years later, how many followers this guy has, how many people think of him as an icon of left-wing politics. Who was Henry Wallace? Um, former Secretary of Commerce. Uh, he invented the first hybrid corn and made a fortune. And he had this idea that um, the Truman administration and this new thing called the Cold War, which is a very new term at that time, was leading us into World War III and uh, the world was going to be annihilated. So during 
the election cycle, we're seeing this. This is happening right here. These nuclear bomb tests, these atomic bomb tests in the Bikini, Bikini Islands. And Wallace is invited into the Oval Office with Truman to see these images. And he says, they look like chrysanthemums blooming. And he says, someday soon, we are going to see these chrysanthemums, sorry, it's a hard word to pronounce, blooming over the city of Washington. And what Wallace does is he bolts the Democratic Party, creates his own uh, party, which was called the Progressive Party, and um, immediately goes out on the campaign trail saying, Truman is leading us into World War III. I am the candidate of peace. I am the candidate that is literally going to save the world. And his campaign was miraculous. His events were extraordinary. He packed giant stadium. He packed Yankee Stadium with paying customers who came to watch him speak. Um, all the way on the side of your screen here is Pete Seeger, the uh, folk singer. And behind Henry Wallace on the wall in a portrait is Glenn Taylor, who in himself, fascinating larger than life character, a uh, former country and Western singer who was famous for uh, climbing up the steps of the Capitol building on his horse dressed in country and Western gear. He actually, uh, Glenn Taylor made his own wigs. He's wearing one in this picture. Uh, and he went on to make a fortune after his political career making hair pieces. But uh, the important part, the thing I want to mention at this point of Wallace is that he was the candidate of peace and he had a, a small but amazingly passionate following. All right, Strom Thurmond. Um, if I try to do anything in this book, I really try to build the narrative through scene setting and dialogue because with all of my books, I feel like you can go anywhere, you can go on Wikipedia and get the facts. This is what happened, most likely the facts. This is when it happened and this is who it happened to. But what I try to do in these books is make you not just understand what happened, but why it happened, but also to really feel what these people were feeling. I want you to feel like you were in the room. And one of those vivid scenes I'm creating is this picture you're seeing here. So let me explain. Um, Truman goes deep on civil rights in 1948. Uh, just this morning, I interviewed the widow of Medgar Evers. Yesterday, I interviewed Clarence Jones, who was fascinating, who was a speechwriter and a lawyer for Martin Luther King. But when you talk to these people and you really interview people who had experienced the South as a Black person uh, during the Jim Crow era, you really get a sense of what life was like. Um, you cannot vote. You cannot use certain bathrooms. Um, it was a very difficult time to be black in the South. And here civil rights, here Truman comes out uh, after the war, he's gonna come out hard on civil rights. And he's saying a massive number of uh, black Americans fought in the war. They fought for democracy abroad. They deserve all the rights of democracy here at home. Um, not everybody was happy. So in states like Alabama and Georgia or Strom Thurmond's South Carolina, there was decades of tradition of segregation in schools. We think of Plessy versus Ferguson's famous Supreme Court decision of 1896, which ruled that every you know black and white should have separate but equal, which of course we know was not the case. Separate schools, separate water fountains, separate neighborhoods, separate everything, but black people were not allowed to vote. Um, they did not have the privileges of democracy. Truman says, I'm gonna go out and fight for it. And uh, an amazing scene at the Democratic National Convention. You see massive numbers of white politicians from the South with um, Confederate flags. They stand up and they walk out and they say, Truman's cooked. He cannot win. We're going to form our own party and we're going to protect our traditions in the South. And they put um, Strom Thurmond as their candidate. It's called the States Rights Democrats, but it, we know it as the Dixiecrats. And this is their convention. I'm going to read to you right now what Thurman said, a portion of his speech that night. He says, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, and into our homes, and into our churches. These uncalled for and these un-American damnable proposals Truman has recommended under the guise of so-called civil rights I'll tell you the American people had better wake up and oppose such a program 
because the next thing will be a totalitarian state in these United States. Strom Thurmond goes out and campaigns in 1948. He says nothing about taxes. He says nothing about inflation. He says nothing about Israel. He says only one thing. He fights for segregation, and he actually wins four states in the process. Now, here we have Tom Dewey. There's this uh, really dramatic moment early on. Again, I try to set these scenes so that you feel like you're in the room, where Tom Dewey is trying to decide whether he's going to run for president in 1948. And everybody's saying, you're the front runner in the Republican Party. You came the closest of anybody to beating Roosevelt in 1944. Better than Alf, Alf uh, Landon, better than Wendell Wilkie. You're the man for the future. Uh, he's this fascinating character. Um, and I wanted to bring his story to light in this book because, as let me explain it this way. Early in the book, there's this scene where he's deciding whether he wants to run for president. And um, he says, I don't want to be remembered as the guy who lost the presidency twice. And they tell him, you can't lose, Tom. You can't lose. Run for president. You'll win. And he does. And he loses. I gave away the ending, but we know the ending. Um, and sadly, that's pretty much all Americans know about Tom Dewey if they know anything these days. They might know that you know part of the I-87 expressway through the state of New York is named after him. But most people know him just for the headline. Dewey defeats Truman. But in fact, uh, he had an extraordinary career. He was the man during the golden age of organized crime in the 1920s and 1930s in New York City. This is the special prosecutor that took down the mob. Uh, he was amazingly, he won uh, the governorship of New York State by historic margins. And I think by the time you get to the end of the book, there's a scene that's really heartbreaking where he realizes that he just lost the greatest upset <laughs> in American electioneering history. And he has to face the press. Uh, and it's a very moving moment. He has to face his family. His wife is crying. It, it, he was um, really a great man. And when uh, Truman sent later sent troops into Korea, he got a note from Tom Dewey saying, I support you. When there was an attempted assassination on Truman's life, he got a note from Tom Dewey saying, I'm so sorry about what happened to you. And, and I wish the best to you and your family. Uh, I think he would have made an extraordinary two-term president. And the strangest thing is that he and Truman agreed on a lot of policy. So I want to say one more thing about Dewey before we moved on. 1948, it should be understood, this was an election that really separated the past from the future. It was the first election of the presidential election of the television age, the first of the nuclear age. It was a line drawn on the sand. These, these parties had to come out and say, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is our vision for the post-war world. Now, the Republican Party had an identity crisis. Now, the conservative faction on Capitol Hill led by Bob Taft, they were conservative Republicans from you know the, the 1920s, the senior Taft, the Taft who was in the White House, Calvin Coolidge, uh, small government, very little spending, states' rights, the less the better. Um, Thomas Dewey was raised almost religiously by his father to represent the other faction of the Republican Party, which was the Teddy Roosevelt faction of the party. As a matter of fact, his father named him after Teddy. So his father called Tom Dewey Ted because his initials were Thomas E. Dewey. Um, so there's this fight between these two factions in the Republican Party. And what happens is Dewey wins the nomination but the Congress is controlled by the conservatives and there's a problem there. Very few people notice it at the time, but one person who does is Harry Truman. Okay. Uh, for the second part of my talk tonight, I wanna talk a little bit about why this story is relevant right now. And I think when you get to the end, you'll be like, wow, I get it. Um, when Truman was a young lad, uh, he read a lot. And when he became president, people were concerned because he, he had no college degree. And there was concern that he was not educated. But in fact, he was very well educated. And um, the reason why is because he read as a child. And when I talk to classes, I talk about this all the time, the importance of reading and why history matters. That's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, when Truman was young, uh, 
he he did this reading and he came to this one conclusion. I'm going to read a quote. He said, I began to see that the history of the world has moved in cycles and that very often we find ourselves in the midst of political circumstances which appear to be new, appear to be new, but which might have existed in almost identical form at various times during the past 6,000 years. Um, I'm going to give you examples of why that is true and why it's kind of almost shocking how much was going on in 1948 that feels surprisingly and at times uncomfortably relative, uh, relevant today. So in 1945, Truman goes to the Potsdam Conference. He's a new president, and he has to sit down with uh, Stalin here and negotiate about the future of the world. And the Cold War begins over one issue, the first issue that we disagree upon that starts the entire Cold War is the government of Poland. So Stalin thinks that I put my own, I install my own government in Poland. And Truman says, well, Poland should have their own democratic elections. The people of Poland should choose their leader. And that's the disagreement. And Stalin says, but Poland is a nation that borders Russia, the Soviet Union. It's very close to Moscow. We don't understand why the United States should have any opinion over the government of Poland. And there's this misunderstanding. Uh, right now, that exact misunderstanding is happening in Ukraine. Um, here you have Vladimir Putin who's saying, I should be able to control who's in power in Ukraine. It borders our country. It's the exact same scenario. We can just hope today what happened in, 19, in the late 1940s doesn't happen 40 years of Cold War. Uh, in 1948, this is something really, I would say, very unique to this book, some reporting that I did that you will not find anywhere else. Um, there is, whether or not there is Russian interference in our election in 2016, I'm not going to address the issue. Everybody has their own opinion. Many books will be written. No one will ever agree. But I can tell you that in 1948, the Democratic Party was very concerned that Stalin was going to push and, and interfere with our election in 1948. They thought the Democrats, a lot of the, the inner circle of Democrats thought that the Henry Wallace's candidacy um, was designed by the Soviets to siphon away Truman's votes and give the election to the Republicans. The Republicans thought that Moscow was going to interfere in Truman's favor. And in this year, I'm just going to read you this document, which I found in Thomas Dewey's paper at the university, papers at the University of Rochester. This is written by a, a member of the Republican National Committee. He says, the Kremlin will sponsor political disturbances everywhere it can throughout the next 12 months. It will try to influence the result of the 1948 election by every means conceivable. So you can see Thomas Dewey sitting at his desk reading this document thinking, huh, here's another quote from the same document. The United States of America is fair game for Moscow and has been for years. And as far as anyone is willing to see, the year 1948 will be the year in which Soviet Russia will do everything in its power to influence the election here. So it was in 1948, it continues. This I mentioned during the 1948 election, we have these nuclear bomb tests going off, unnerving the world. It was not secret. This was causing headlines. Everybody knew what was going on. Um, there was tremendous fear at the time that this Cold War is beginning, and eventually, it was just a matter of days, that the Soviets were going to have their own bomb, and we were in for trouble. Today, if anybody's ever heard of the Bureau of Atomic Scientists, uh, they publish a very famous journal uh, that has something called a doomsday clock. And the doomsday clock measures what these editors of this very important, prestigious academic magazine say, the doomsday clock measures how close we are to nuclear war. And sadly, it is higher now than it's ever been. So the fear was there in 1948 and it remains. Um, a point I wanna make about Henry Wallace. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the most dramatic scenes in, in Dewey Defeats Truman, I have Henry Wallace going into the deep south to campaign for the presidency. 
And he announces before he goes, I will not stay in any hotel where members of my black committee cannot stay. I will not stay in any segregated motel or hotel, which in the South meant no hotel. He said, I will not speak in any hall where black and white cannot sit next to each other. Wallace knew that when he went to campaign in the Deep South, that his politics were so controversial there that there was going to be a violence. And there, in fact, there was. His vice presidential candidate was thrown in jail. Member, uh, people were stabbed at his rallies. Members of his staff were literally beaten with fists. And he would go up and get behind the lectern and get hit with tomatoes, ice cream cones, for real. And he would say, I would like to understand, I would like to understand for real, this is the United States of America. I'm a politician speaking my beliefs. It's a free country. And it would rain down more tomatoes and ice cream cones and eggs. And this man had the courage to do that. One thing I want to say is like, what it showed me was the divide between pockets of America that are deeply conservative and pockets of America that were are deeply liberal, that were then, were and now, Wallace, the same candidate, could then go back to Los Angeles and pack a stadium. There were really two Americas at that time, at their extremes, and what his candidacy shows, showed to put a spotlight on those two extremes, and that's exactly what's happening today. I think that we're going to see more and more of that as uh, the election in November, next November, gets closer. Um, it does not take a lot of explaining to why this is relevant today. So this is a picture of uh, a gathering in Washington, D.C. on the day of Israel's birth. It's May 15, 1948. Um, Truman, as we know, was the first world leader to come out and support uh, the state of Israel. And all of this is happening during the election cycle. And now I, I go deep in this book about the drama that the president of the United States faced at that time with the decision of whether he was going to support the state of Israel. Um, and to me, it's shocking, shockingly relevant to what we're seeing today. Truman's own State Department, George Marshall, Secretary of State, whom we respected more than any other man in Washington, numerous meetings, George Marshall and all the State Department, and they're saying to him, Mr. President, you can't support the state of Israel. Israel is about to be founded. They can't stop it. The refugees are leaving Europe. They're gathering in Palestine. They're going to form a nation. And the State Department says, Mr. President, if you support the state of Israel, we're going to upset the Arabs. And they're selling us oil. And we are going to have a war with the Soviet Union. And if we don't get that oil from the Arab nations, we will not be able to fight. And we will be conquered by the Soviet Union. The State Department is also saying, Mr. President, if you support the state of Israel, the, the, the state of Israel will not survive without financial, massive financial and military support from the United States. The United States just finished this long war. The electorate is not going to stand for it. Americans are not going to stand for it. You shouldn't do this. On the other side, Truman saw a moral issue. Of course, we know what happened in the concentration camps, the refugee crisis, and there's a lot of history there, uh, something called the Balfour Declaration, where the Jews were promised their homeland many, many years before it actually happened. And now it's really happening. Um, so the state of Israel is founded. Truman becomes the first world leader to recognize the government there with caveats. But right away, the first Arab-Israeli war begins, and there's a massive refugee crisis. And every politician who's running in 1948 has to choose a side. Um, and uh, Truman chose his side. I support, I personally support the, the side that he chose uh, at that time, but it was a very complicated decision, and it's a very complicated decision now. The circumstances are slightly different now, but in many ways, they're shockingly similar. Um, I'm going to only say just a very quick thing about this massive white nationalist movement following World War II. Uh, following World War II, you had hundreds of thousands of black soldiers returning 
from war overseas. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, saying we fought for uh, democracy abroad. We want to be able to vote here. We want to be able to go and sit at whatever lunch counter and whatever seat on a bus we want. We want full citizenship rights, like it says in the 14th Amendment, like it says in the 15th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Do those documents actually mean anything? And there was massive pushback at that time. Uh, here you see the Ku Klux Klan rallying. And here you see Charlottesville. I don't think that uh, we've seen in many years the rise of white nationalism that we've been seeing in the past five or six years now. Alger Hess, if I was speaking to an open auditorium, this is where I would say, who knows who this guy is? And someone would raise their hand and say, Alger Hiss. Um, also during the 1948 election cycle, the first, well, actually the second Red Scare is unfolding and it's shocking news. And what you're seeing here is Alger Hiss testifying. And the point I wanna make here is Congress is holding hearings about a so-called communist conspiracy. Was there a con communist conspiracy infiltrating our government? And what many people were feeling at the time was that there was a, a mistrust that, that we could not trust the politicians who are running our country. Was it true? Was it not true? What is a conspiracy theory? What is fact? Every politician at the time saw this and said, I have to come down on one side or the other. We need to root out the communists in this country or communists have a right to be in this country. Um, was there conspiracy? Obviously, conspiracy theories have taken over all of, all of our media discussions these days. It's very hard to suss out what is fact and what is not. Can we trust, trust our politicians? Today, we call it the deep state. At that time, we called it the Red Scare. But it was in, extraordinarily impactful in terms of how these politicians were running their campaigns. OK. This is a picture of Isaac Woodard. Um, again, a very dramatic scene in the White House plays out. The day that the head of the NAACP, Walter White, um, I wrote a biography of Walter White called White Lies, and I hope everybody reads it. Um, Walter White of the NAACP comes to the White House and tells Truman the story of this man. There was a trend at the end of World War II, I've touched on it already, where you had a number of black soldiers coming back demanding full citizenship rights in the United States of America. This man, Isaac Woodard in the center, had fought overseas in the South Pacific for three years, and he was returning to America. He was on a bus in South Carolina, traveling to be reunited with his family. He was still in his uniform. He had his discharge papers in his pocket with the mimeographed signature of Harry Truman right there on him. And he had about $54 in his pocket. And he asked to use a bathroom. And um, the bus driver, the white bus driver was not pleased. And there was an altercation with the police officer and Isaac Woodard was permanently blinded in both eyes and no one was held accountable. And because of the NAACP and Walter White, this massive swell of passion arose around this guy's story. Here you see him being led upstairs to a speaker's rostrum where he was going to speak. Right there is the former uh, heavyweight champion, Joe Lewis, uh, escorting him. And Isaac Woodard's story became a real cause celeb, the same way we're seeing the story of George Floyd and the rallying of white and black um, movement around civil rights, around this man. And when Truman hears this guy's story, he stands up and he says, we have got to do something. And the very next day, he sends a, a um, memorandum to Tom Clark, who's the attorney general of the United States. And you can go online and read that. It's an extraordinary document. And really in that document, you see the beginning of the civil rights movement from the point of view of the White House. And that's when Truman decides to go deep on civil rights. Here you see him speaking to the NAACP. So during the, it's, I cannot express, I cannot overstate how um, controversial it was 
for the president of the United States to really come out in favor of civil rights the way that Truman did in the 1948 election. He becomes the first president to address the NAACP. That's what you're seeing here. He becomes the first president to campaign in the spiritual heart of Black America in Harlem. And he desegregates the military. Um, it's very risky. It turns out to be a good move, but I get asked all the time, and he got asked all the time, did you do that for political reasons? And it almost destroyed him. The fact is he did it for moral reasons. Um, okay. A new media. So today, social media has completely changed the way that politicians run their campaigns. At that time, it was television. What you're looking at here is the very first ever election night television broadcast. We're so familiar with it now with our maps and digitized everything. And uh, this is what it looked like in 1948. This is election night. Uh, I, I have a piece of video from M NBC television. Let's play it and see if it works. We have uh, obtained the results from the state of Ohio, which assures victory for President Truman and Senator Barkley. With Ohio's 25 electoral votes, President Truman and Senator Barkley will have a total of 266 votes in the Electoral College. This is the minimum figure necessary for victory. This figure, however, does not take into consideration the very favorable trends still developing in California, Colorado, Idaho, and Nevada. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up with a couple of thoughts here. At the heart of all of this, here's what happened. Truman makes... It comes up with this idea that if he goes on this whistle top stop tour and he travels all over the country on a train and goes to all of these little tiny places where people have never imagined in their lives they would get to actually see a president of the United States, they would show up just to see the president of the United States and then he could talk to them. Sometimes it would be at four in the morning and he would be in his pajamas. Sometimes it would be raining into midnight. And the mechanics of the speeches that he made, uh, I go deep into in the book because it's fascinating. But a lot of what he did was speak impromptu. He had a research division that would give him a note card saying, you are coming into this town in South Dakota. They're opening a new sausage factory and they had a plane crash last year. And he would use that to just try to connect with people, not as the president of the United States once they came to see him, but connect to them as Harry. And by the end of the campaign, you had this, hundreds of thousands of people turning out to see the president of the United States. I'm going to say one more thing. One of my favorite things about writing this book, and to me personally, one of the most inspiring things was to see Truman in, in action because his family was aboard the campaign trail. Um, he has always served as a role model. This is Hey Geography here. It's not in the book, but I'm allowed to do it here. He's always served as a role model for me in the, in the way he respected his wife and the way he adored his daughter. So there's Margaret, um, who voted for the first time for president in 1948. And here's the electoral map. So for a guy who was completely out of the picture, who nobody gave him a chance to win, this is what you saw in the end. Uh, interesting to note that down here at the bottom, the brown states, 10-9 at the bottom, those are states won by Strom Thurmond. Um, and I will say that uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch was not the only media outlet that said that Dewey won. It was reported all over the world. It was reported in Munich. It was reported in Women's Wear Daily that Thomas Dewey had won the election. So sure was America that Truman was going to lose. Uh, my final point, this is my last slide. The Republican, the 80th Congress um, leading up to the election voted to increase the budget for the inauguration because they were so sure that Dewey was going to win. So the Republicans controlled the Congress. They boosted the amount that the president could spend on the inauguration party. And of course, Harry Truman was the one who won. So here you can see him. He's clearly having a good time. Uh, that's Margaret over on, on way on the left of the screen. Uh, and that's how the book ends. I'll leave you with one last quote. Uh, this is Senator Arthur Vandenberg, powerful Republican of, of, of uh, Michigan, um, a Republican. He says this at the end. 
You've got to give the little man credit. There he was, flat on his back. Everybody had counted him out, but he came up fighting and won the battle. He did it all by himself. That's the kind of courage the American people admire. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, AJ, for that presentation. If you have a question and haven't added it to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, please go ahead and do so now. You can also like a question that's already been submitted that you would like to see answered. Our first question tonight comes from Richard. He asks, can you expand on Truman seeing a gap in the GOP between Taft and Dewey's sides? How did he exploit it on the campaign trail? That's a great question. Um, it's again, the drama. It's so, it's so to me as it's just fascinating and fun to look at in retrospect. So very few people understood what was going on, but Truman being the brilliant politician, he recognized that there was a schism in the party, in the Republican Party. And so what he did at the Democratic National Convention is he called for turnip day. Um, this is sort of slightly complicated, so I'm truncated mm -hmm. in, but basically what he did was he called Congress to come back from recess, come back to Washington and pass some legislation because the fact was he recognized that Thomas Dewey supported some of the same principles and policies that Harry Truman did that Congress was virulently against. So what he could do was call Congress back in to session and force them to pass legislation, knowing they would not, because the, the Republican-controlled Congress would not support some of the same policies that the Democratic candidate did support. Uh, in doing so, that's why uh, you know the turnip day Congress is such a famous term. It's a little tricky to explain, but hopefully if you if you read the book, it's very clear. But it was a brilliant political move and and highly dramatic. So you have to imagine congressmen and senators all over the country getting this phone call at three in the morning, East Coast time, saying, did you hear about Truman? And they're all like, what did he do? And then they found out. And then they were put in the spotlight on the hot seat. Like, are you going to support? Are these Republicans in Congress going to support their own candidate and pass the legislation that he is calling for, and they wouldn't do it. All right. Our next question comes from Frank, and he is asking how much time you spent researching at the Truman Library. Great question, Frank. Um, if, if there are repeat customers, so to speak, I apologize if I tell the same stories over and over. <laughs> but... Um, what when I first decided to write about Truman, um, I remember my father because I was he was the one who introduced me to Truman. He was a Truman nut, and he had a portrait of Truman in our home growing up. And um, I just always remember seeing this portrait in his office and in our home, and not knowing who it was. I thought he was like some distant grandpa or something. <laughs> and it was later in life that I found out who he was, and you know, through my father. And when I told my father that. I was going to write about Truman. He said, you can't do that. And I said, why? And he said, McCullough, McCullough. <laughs> he thought that David McCullough's biography of Truman was so brilliant and so extensive that nothing needed to be said about Truman anymore. And my plan was to do something very different and take very small narratives that illuminate the Truman presidency and make those the focus, these like very, you know, uh, specific sort of chapters in the Truman presidency. And the first thing that I did when I decided I was going to write about Truman was I wrote a letter to the uh, uh, email to the archivist there saying, uh, I'm going to come to the library one week out of every month, and I'll continue doing so until the work is done. And that's what I did. So I started mm -hmm. spending a lot of time there, and I got to know people there. And I feel so blessed because they remain some friends to this day, and I always love going there. I think that it's super important that we all recognize that in this country, presidential libraries exist, that they're funded by our government. And you know what they mean, what they mean is anybody who's willing to follow the rules and not destroy the materials in there has the right and the privilege to go to a presidential library and have access to the actual documents of that presidency, because that means that government is transparent. That's what the whole um, 
Trump case and the Hillary, Hillary Clinton email stuff. That's what that's all about. And it's a really important issue. I'm not pointing fingers and saying that's not my job here tonight. But what I am trying to say is those papers of every presidency belong to the American people and we have access to them. Um, I will also say, I think it's really important that um, that the archivists there at the Truman Library and other presidential libraries have done an extraordinary and important job of digitizing documents so that we can have access to them from our homes. So for example, tomorrow you wake up and you can go on the Truman Library's website and have access to extraordinary documents and go deep on all sorts of subjects like civil rights, uh, like the Red Scare, all of this stuff. You can read the actual documents right from your, from your living room chair. Excellent. All right, our next question comes from John, who asks, why and how did you settle on the book's subtitle? Great question. Um, give me a moment. <laughs> uh, Harry Truman speaking at Chicago Stadium, October 25th, 1948. It is not just a battle between two parties. It is a fight for the very soul of the American government. And so that's why I called it the battle for America's soul, because I felt like that's really what the book was about, but I could use in the subtitle, uh, Harry Truman's own words. Excellent. That's beautiful, AJ. Our next question comes from Stephen, who asks, what role, if any, did Mrs. Truman play in her husband's victory? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, Mrs. Truman lived on the campaign train. Um, in describing the, the place that they lived, I really tried, again, I, I repeat myself, I apologize, but it's important to me that if you read the book that you feel like you've sat on that train and you were there in the room that night. For example, there's this great scene where Everybody, the, the the you know the president and the first lady and Margaret are sitting on their train on the in the train car for a moment where they were just reading, and the train car where they lived was the only uh, car that actually had a shower in it. So nobody else, eighty reporters, uh, hundreds of staffers, all traveling on this train all over the country, had no shower, no laundry, nothing like that. Uh, but on Truman's, in, they had a shower. And it was the only place that uh, there was a telephone that only worked when they were at a stop where they could hook up the telephone, but they also had a speedometer. So you, they always knew how fast the train was going, which I find fascinating. Um, but Mrs. Truman lived on the train. And um, okay, and again, th there are all of these oral histories. Everybody involved in this, uh, particip almost everybody participated in oral history. And all of them are available on, on the Truman Library's website, and you can read them. And uh, so if you really read them all, um, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. But you find in there the staffers talking about Mrs. Truman. And so I was able to build in the book what they thought of her and what they thought she was doing. And she was a very, very private woman. She felt very uncomfortable with the press. She felt very uncomfortable in front of cameras but she felt very comfortable in the opinions that she had and the way she spoke to her husband. So I think that she had a really remarkable influence, not on policy, but on communication. Um, she definitely had the president's ear. Um, and yeah, I hope that answers the question. But again, what I was saying before is it was just really wonderful to experience what life was like for for the president. The one more point I will make. This is funny. <laughs> um, nobody on the campaign tr train believed Truman could win. Nobody, except for one man, and that was Harry Truman. And there's this one moment where he's having um, uh, a lunch with um, certain members of his team who were not always traveling. Uh, there's a couple of people specifically, and I can't remember their name, but one was the sort of head of the women's committee of the Truman for President movement. And she's at lunch. And he says to her, you know, um, you're the only woman in this entire country who thinks I can I can um, win this election. And his wife is sitting at the table. <laughs> really funny. So it was kind of well known that not even Mrs. Truman thought her husband was going to win. Oh, 
All right. Our next question comes from Brian, who asked, did Truman and Marshall ever truly rebuild their relationship after the division over the decision regarding Israel? Another great question. I think, yes, they did. And I think that there was such deep respect between those two individuals. individuals. They respected each other so much that um, there was no formal break. And uh, it came so close that when Truman was ready to announce to the public that he was going to support the state of Israel, uh, he needed George Marshall's, he didn't need his approval, but he needed to know that the Secretary of State was not going to go out and undermine him in front of the entire world. And the Secretary, I don't have, I mean, I have the correspondence in the book. Um, but George Marshall essentially said, I think you're doing this to win an election, um, but so be it. Uh, there's a chain of a command. I'm a military man, and I'm going to keep my opinions to myself, and we're going to move on and continue to build a great America. That was essentially what Marshall said, and that's where they left it. And Truman said, that's all I need to know. And a day later, he came out in support of Israel. Wonderful. All right, our next question comes from the mayor of Independence, Mr. Rory Rowland. Rory asks, what is your favorite Truman story? And it's a two-parter. The second question is, does character matter anymore in politics? Okay. Hi, Rory. It's great to see you again. <laughs> um, I have two favorite Truman stories. One is the first four months of the Truman administration, and it's a book called The Accidental President. And the second is how Truman won the 48 election, which is Dewey defeats Truman. So those are the two stories that I love most, which is why I spent, you know, years of my life digging into them. Does character matter anymore? That's a tough one. Um, I'm always careful when I speak to audiences, understanding who I'm talking to. Um, because this is not CNN and it's not MSS, NBC, and it's not Fox News. So um, I have to understand, especially talking to a Truman audience, which is what I love, <laughs> is that we're going to have people who come from all walks of life and all political persuasions who love and respect President Truman. Um, does character, I think, let me answer that. This is how I'll answer that question. I think that the problems that we have today stem from the death of local news. All of the news that Americans get today, most Americans, they tune into one channel or another. All the power has ended up in a very small number of hands. And so tremendous number of Americans getting their all their news from CNN or MSNBC, all their news from Fox, that's really the problem with America today, because if you add social media into that, you end up with a situation where nobody's held accountable. Nobody's held accountable for what they say because they're only speaking to their own audience. So does character matter anymore? I sure hope it does, because it's going to take true leadership and true character, the kind of character that we saw in Harry Truman. I'm not going to fish it, fish it out of the book right now, but there's something that he said once that I loved. It's in there. He said, it's not important if I am the next president of the United States. What's important is that the, the United States continues on the path of greatness. And until there are leaders who have a sense that truth matters um, and that greatness for the future of America is not just for their supporters, um, we're going to get somewhere. So I'm hoping that character matters. Um, I think that we have a crisis of leadership that hopefully someday somebody will solve. Excellent. We've got time for a few more here. Our next question comes from David, who asks, where did Truman get his grit to stand up and battle for the presidency when everyone, including his own family, didn't think he would win. I would have to say that that's the greatest part of the story. That's the best part of the story. Where did he get it from? A guy who was an obscure farmer. He was 30 years old, living as an obscure farmer who had no 
thought that he would ever do anything else with his life. Uh, I would have to say, if I think most uh, Truman scholars would say, well, he fought, he was a captain in World War I, and that's what did it. That's what taught him that he had leadership skills. And that story is extraordinary. He had, he had to command troops in battle. Um, when he took command of troops in battle, he was terrified. And we know from the oral histories of people there who were present when he stood up in front of these soldiers headed into war that he gave his first speech and he was terrified. His knees were literally knocking. He didn't know how to lead soldiers. He had never been in war. And at the end of World War I, none of his soldiers had died, none of his command, and every one of them loved him. And they were essentially the real nut colonel, colonel, the beginning of his political career, because he knew that if he ever needed a favor, any of them would, would cross the country to do anything for him. Um, that's where I think he got it from. Excellent. All right, we'll take one last question. This was asked early and we've got a handful of upvotes on it. Will you, for our final question, repeat the quote you ended your presentation with? Yeah, the quote I ended my presentation yes, with? Yes, the Truman Cycle quote. Uh, tell me if this is the right one. This is Arthur Vandenberg, Senator from Michigan after Truman had won. You've got to hand it to the little man. You've got to hand excuse me, you've got to give the little man credit. There he was, flat on his back. Everyone had counted him out, but he came up fighting and won the battle. He did it all by himself. That's the kind of courage the American people admire. That's perfect. Thank you so much, AJ. Mm -hmm. AJ, we can't thank you enough for being here this evening and for this wonderful, and as you pointed out, prescient topic uh sharing this story with us tonight i really appreciate it My pleasure. thank you don't forget for all everybody still watching to register for the 17th annual bennett forum on the presidency presidency november 30th at unity temple on the plaza this year's forum features a panel of historians veterans and experts discussing president truman's desegregation of the military this is an exclusive member event, so please renew or join now to reserve your spot. Tickets are also on sale now to visit the all-new Truman Library. As always, members enjoy the benefit of free year-round access to the museum. To become a member or purchase your tickets, visit trumanlibraryinstitute.org. Special thanks again to you, AJ, and thank you all for tuning in and supporting President Truman's legacy. Good Thank night, you. everyone.